Welcome to our Saturday, March 2nd edition of Saturday Simulcast. Want to thank our sponsor, the Purdue Union Club Hotel and the Boiler Up Bar, 811 Bistro, Leaps Coffee. The great folks are there that uh, have treated us so well for so long. Great place to be there uh, this weekend, obviously, for a Boilermaker Festival of sorts. And, of course, next weekend for Senior Day, it will be a hopping place. But we appreciate them very much. Today's show features interview with Brian Newbert talking all things Purdue, Michigan State. And also in second segment will be Boilermaker Alliance CEO David Neff. Uh, he'll talk about uh, what's going on with the Alliance, a lot going on there. Then in third segment, Kevin Sullivan, a Purdue graduate from 1980, a graduate of the Purdue SID office. But he went on to uh, great things with the Dallas Mavericks for 18 years. He's worked for NBC. He was in the Bush White House as the press secretary in that office. And he has a very unique opinion on, uh, he's talked to a couple NBA executives on Zach Eady. Really good interview all throughout. Uh, not necessarily the interviewee, but the, in, or not necessarily the interviewer, but the interviewee. But uh, you'll enjoy that. So uh, without further ado, uh, on with the show. All right, Brian, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, I, at the start of this season, I think you were one of the few ones that saw this coming with Michigan State, I should say. But at the start of the season, this was going to be the game, uh, Purdue-Michigan State, uh, two teams that were ranked in the top five to start the season. It is still a huge game for Purdue as the Boilermakers could claim its 26th Big Ten championship with a victory. They may have it before the game actually starts. But what a difference some time can make between where the Boilermakers are right now and where the Spartans are. Spartans are fighting for their, their NCAA tournament life, but uh, uh, an interesting development to say the least. What do you, what do you expect to see on Saturday night? Um, I expect Purdue to be pretty hard to beat at home. Uh, yeah. Obviously uh, I think Michigan state historically, this is the last situation you'd want to find them in uh, having lost their last couple games, having played themselves onto the bubble as opposed to off the bubble, uh, you know, this was supposed to be um, the game of the year. You know, this was supposed to be the number one team in the Big Ten versus the number two team in the Big Ten. Michigan State was a popular pick to, you know, be a Final Four contender this year, if not a team that could actually supplant Purdue atop the Big Ten. But yeah, right. it's kind of what I call the funhouse mirror of the NCAA tournament, <laughs> where it, yeah. it distorts reality. Michigan State wins one game that matters last year in the NCAA tournament. They bring back all the same above-average players, only a year older, who lost 11, 12 games, whatever it was last year, were a non-factor in the Big Ten race. And since they're all back, and it's Tom Izzo, everybody figured that it was – and he's obviously earned that, but everybody yeah, thought that all of a sudden you were, good, you were going to go from this middle-of-the-pack Big Ten team to this top-five team just because you have all these guys back and a promising recruiting class coming in for a coach who plays seniors over freshmen. Um, it just never made any sense. And it, it has been, it has been exactly kind of what I figured uh, it would be what logic suggested it would be that all the same players would yield much the same results. And uh, you know, Michigan state has, has, has 11 losses now, obviously isn't anything like the team that people figured they would be. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not dangerous. Uh, they obviously are. As I said before, historically, you never want a desperate Tom Izzo team. I just don't know if this Tom Izzo team has that extra gear that they tend to come up with. They've historically come up with in situations where their proverbial backs are to the wall. Um, but Purdue obviously uh, has a lot to play for here with the, uh, with the Big Ten title on the line. Uh, there'd be no better opponent to clinch it against. Um, you know, it would be kind of a figurative passing of the baton here as Purdue sort of replaces Michigan State to a certain extent as the class of the Big Ten, as I wrote about the other day. Um, but uh, should be a good game, but I, I just have a hard time seeing Purdue losing a home game and losing a home game at this point in the season. Yeah, and another 8 o'clock start. Uh, uh, it will be a, a prime environment, one would expect, uh, as as – as it was when Indiana came uh, for that same eight o'clock game about three weeks ago uh, for the game on Fox. Yes, Tom Izzo has taken Michigan State to no one's disparaging his record. There are eight, eight uh, Final Fours and what is it, 10 Big Ten championships or shares of Big Ten championships at least. 
but yes, uh, it does seem that, uh, and there are even some talking about whether Tom Izzo wants to continue coaching in this environment. I'm not saying we're getting to that point necessarily. I don't. We know. can say that. He. We, um, can, we can say it. I just don't know. We don't cover them, but we watch well, them. But what, do, what do you think about that? I have been at a number of summer events where I, I've seen Tom Izzo taunting the younger coaches <laughs> sitting there at, at recruiting events, laughing at them for the landscape they have to advance their careers <laughs> in. Whereas yeah. he's on his way out, as he likes to, you know, point out to people, so he doesn't have to worry about all the things going on in terms of running a college basketball program nowadays. So I, I, I don't think. I think he's he sees the light at the end of the tunnel here in terms of you know the end of his career. I, I have no idea when he's I, again. I don't cover him. Yeah, uh, I, I don't. I'm not around him on a regular basis or anything like that. I'm I'm just extrapolating from one or two little anecdotes over the years. But he obviously is not a huge fan of uh, what all goes into being a, a head coach at this level in college basketball nowadays. <laughs> not, nothing would surprise me uh, in terms of. When he uh, he decides to step away, and when he does, obviously one of the great careers in college basketball history. Uh, so it's not like it's some some rando just kind of disappearing. He's obviously uh, I don't know if he's a big farewell tour guy. I, I doubt he would do that. Um, there's also I guess some some up in the air dynamics in terms of who's going to replace him. And he he's always struck me as a guy who would like to hand things off to one of his guys, whether or not there's one of his guys who are viable in that sense. Uh, I've always thought Drew Valentine would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, he's never been on on his own staff, but I don't think that's necessarily important. Uh, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but uh, yeah, because uh, <laughs> I asked you. <laughs> I think yeah. he's uh, he's uh, you know he's probably uh, he's probably within striking distance here at. Just, you know, one of these days, just kind of up and walking away. He might be one of those guys who just does what uh, does what some of these, some of these other guys in college coaching did. Uh, you know, Nick Saban, he, he's working one morning, and then that he's afternoon, not. he's just kind of gone. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I mean, it's I think anything's possible here. I do think yeah. there's a little bit of, I don't want to say ego, that, that that's kind of a loaded term, but I, I do think there'd probably be some inclination on his part to to you know, get the appreciation uh, out of this that he obviously has earned that he he deserves. You know, he's flirted with NBA jobs before, and what that's amounted to has been the streets filled with with adoring Izzo fans pleading with him to stay. And uh, I think that you know that sort of thing um, has always been important to him uh, to a certain extent. I'm, I'm not saying that as a slam. I'm just saying that. Yeah. No. I think there's a little bit of vanity there that he's earned. And uh, um, I just don't know if he would just kind of disappear into the night that way uh, or if, if he would draw it out a little bit. But um, I, I, if you ask me whether or not he'll still be the coach at Michigan State in five years, I would probably be inclined to say no more than I'd be inclined to say yes. Yeah, I think it makes sense at age 69 too. And, uh, and uh, yes, he is kind of the voice of Michigan State in their some of their – university crisis he's kind of the ones the one that has been been there for that uh, school all right purdue uh you know has has that uh, six day break after the win against michigan uh one would think that uh, you know this is kind of their second in fact they had that six day break i believe it was heading into the last time they played on a saturday night when they played indiana but just talk about the dynamics of where Purdue is. Obviously, a a at at arm's length victory over Michigan, which was uh, which was uh, got the job done. Uh, what does Purdue need to do? Even these last, in your view, the last three regular season games before you head to Big Ten tournament. What do you want to see? I mean, you're going to have a tough game against Illinois. You'll have a you'll have a tough game of sorts on Saturday night against Michigan State, just because it's Michigan State, but. What uh, what do you want to see if you're if you're a Purdue observer looking at these last three comp regular season games? Just be sharp. I mean, just be on top of yeah. things. I mean, I mean, I don't think there's been a game this year where Purdue just hasn't shown up. Yeah, and I, I don't anticipate them starting now. Uh, I I, th I think that's been a pretty positive sign. Now, losing and not showing up are not the same thing. Yeah. Um I think Purdue's been pretty uh, been pretty dialed in all year. Even the games they've lost, you know, other than Nebraska, which was a you know, a typical Big Ten road game boat race. 
that I don't think anybody was winning there that night. Um, they've been pretty good. It's just a matter of taking care of the basketball, you know, being as detail oriented and as effective as you can be from a defensive perspective. I think they're okay defensively. I don't think they're great defensively. I don't yeah. think they'll ever be great defensively, but I think they can be better uh, than they have been. Um, and just keep showing up. Just keep, 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 keep giving good effort and, you know, don't squander it now. Uh, you know, Purdue had a great season um, under, um, you know, uh, some circumstances that might have held back a lot of teams. There's been a lot of pressure on Purdue this year, you know, and that's that's uh, kind of a situation they've thrived in it as opposed to uh, folding under the weight of. And um, I think just keep it up, you know, and you obviously want to close the season strong. You want to go into the postseason feeling good about yourself. You obviously want to win as many championships as you can get. I think – Obviously, the, the writing is on the wall about Purdue getting at least a piece of the Big Ten title, which is important. And then I, th I think the Big Ten tournament, you know, people will say, hey, it doesn't matter. Just get some rest for the NCAA tournament. Well, if there's championships there to be won, go win. You know, you have the best team, one of the best teams in the country. You may as well go get a, might as well go get a championship. There's no real data to tell anyone, hey, it's better to lose in the first round of the Big Ten tournament than, than not. Um I, I don't think losing going into the NCAA tournament is ever a positive thing. Um, but I think you just kind of want to stay on top of things at this stage of the season and not and not show any kind of vulnerabilities and not give any reason for doubt going into the postseason. All right. You've watched a lot of Big Ten basketball and seen a lot of it in person. I, I don't even know when your all Big Ten ballot is due. And I, I don't even do you pick 10 or do you pick five? I don't even remember anymore. 15. But, uh, you pick 15. Yeah, first, second, and third teams. All right, so give me your top. All right, Braden Smith and Zach Eady will be on that ballot, I assume, in the top 15. First team, yes. And you'll be on your first team. Will Lance Jones make your top 15? He will be on either my second or my third team, as will Fletcher Lawyer as of right now. We will see what how both those guys finish up. But um, as of right now, I have four guys on my top 15 that might seem excessive but produce the best team in the league and i i think it's i think it's it's justified so um right as of right now my first team is uh zach ed braden smith boo booey uh i have to make a decision when push comes to shove between marcus damask and Terrence shannon yeah it's a tough um one. i do think that you know being charged with a felony and getting suspended is something that hurts your team. So that's not a moralistic stand that I'm taking there. It's yeah. a practical basketball matter yeah. as well as a moralistic issue. Um, obviously innocent until proven guilty, but, and then the fifth spot, I think uh, Tyson Walker uh, from Michigan state yeah, as of right now. I mean, we'll see yeah. how they finish up. Yeah. And you're going to see, you're going to see Damask again in person on Tuesday night. Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting on, well, it would have been on Wednesday night against Minnesota. I think like he scores in the first half, comes back and scores, a, or he had very little, maybe he had a, yeah. a basket or two in the first half, comes back. Well, he also and, really carried them when Shannon was out too, and I, I no think doubt. He he's terrific. I think he deserves I, he, he to be recognized for that. He, he he's been really good this year, really good. Yeah, uh, I think you're. I think you're right on that, and uh, it'll be interesting to see who who does make it but i think you're not far off of uh, off of that from that standpoint because uh, those guys those are the guys that have really made a difference throughout the course of this big 10 season it is still an unpredictable year and and, and obviously we'll find out in a couple of weeks how many teams in the big 10 make the big make the nca tournament uh, and you know nebraska takes a loss on thursday night uh, by a good margin uh, yet they're a team that seems to be in Michigan State, seems to be in good enough shape, but they're starting to play their way out of it. Um, it's hard to imagine you'd see less than five or six teams from the Big Ten, but I guess it all depends how it all shakes out here in the last couple of weeks of the regular season. Yeah. It's a bad year in the Big Ten. I mean, that's, yeah. after Purdue and, you know, probably Illinois, it's like the yeah. best mid-major league in the country. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it looked like Wisconsin was pretty good there for a while. They came back to earth 
in a in a in a really hard way. Ohio State's played better since changing coaches. I don't think there's any causation there, but I think that yeah, um, you know, it's been a lost season for them. It's been a lost season for Michigan. It's been a lost season for Indiana. And look who we're talking about here. We're talking about three of your biggest brands in the league: Michigan, Ohio State, and Indiana. All, are pretty much all in the toilet this year, and um, I think part of that is the reason why you've got upstarts like Minnesota and Wisconsin kind of taken not Wisconsin, Nebraska taking taking advantage of, of the situation and playing themselves into borderline and CAA status here. And uh, I just think the league's not very good. Um, and that's part, that could be a reflection of the changing times. Maybe the, the transfer era hasn't been a good thing for the Big Ten. It's been a continuity-based league forever. Um, doesn't mean it always has to be, but I think that – You've seen some teams really do well uh, in the portal, Illinois, namely uh, Purdue, uh, even though Purdue's not going to put a lot of emphasis on recruiting transfers every year. Uh, obviously, Northwestern and Purdue benefited significantly NIL-wise from being able to keep their guys in school. Zach Eady at Purdue, Boo Boo at Northwestern. Um, but, you know, you also look at Indiana as one of those cautionary tales of just how much you can flub the portal, too. And yeah. uh, how much that matters, uh, and it's just been kind of a kind of, kind of an uneven deal in that regard. You've got Iowa playing pretty well now, and they didn't look like they were going to be in the tournament um, earlier in the season. Uh, nothing would surprise me here these last couple of weeks in terms of who actually gets in and who doesn't get in, um, because you've got some teams making some late cases for themselves. You've got some teams playing their way out of it, as Michigan State is. That's why it's so important for Michigan State Saturday to at least be competitive. Uh, you can't come into Mac, you're going to get blown out again like they have a couple times over the years. Um, that would be a really bad look as you're trying to try not, try not, trying to legitimize yourself as a NCAA tournament team. Yeah, hard to imagine the Spartans have not won in Mac Arena since 2014, uh, and uh, that is a hard thing. But, you know, you look even like the teams like Ohio State – who has beaten Purdue, Michigan State. They beat on Nebraska, I mean, by you know, relatively soundly at home here on Thursday night. Uh, they, have, they have a lot of work to do at best. They're going to have to have a deep, deep run and, and, and hope for the best in the Big Ten tournament and, and, and win out probably to have a chance to even be considered in the NCAA tournament. They're not even considered on the bubble. So it will be an interesting last few weeks, uh, uh, last couple of weeks. Uh, if Purdue, from Purdue standpoint, uh, if you're a Purdue fan, you, you hope you can get the 26th Big Ten Championship wrapped up on Saturday night, but uh, uh, we'll see how that goes uh, from that standpoint. All right, Brian, thank you so much. As always, we will – uh, look for your work uh, not only on Saturday night, but as we lead into a you know a busy final week of the season when you have a game at Illinois Tuesday, and then of course uh, Purdue hosting Wisconsin on Sunday, and the end of the uh, senior day for Zach Eady and Mason Gillis and Ethan Morton as well. That will be an interesting. Uh, there'll be a lot to talk about next week with that. So stay tuned. We are joined now by CEO of the Boilermaker Alliance, David Neff. Dave Neff joins us, and uh, he has been in that position for a few months. He's a grizzled veteran now, I'm sure. As it brings the smiles to his face. But uh, welcome to uh, talking to our goldenblack.com audience. But uh, you have been a busy man over the last few months since uh, since joining the Alliance as the CEO. Hey, it's always a pleasure to be on with you, Alan. And uh, yeah, you're right. I've been in this role uh, coming up on three months and uh, it's been fast and furious, but I think we're making some some good headway and excited to share some updates today. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting. Obviously, Saturday night, uh, this is all all of this and trying to to raise money through the alliance is built on fan enthusiasm and excitement and it's going to be hard pressed to to beat what's going on with men's basketball right now saturday night michigan state comes to town is t-shirt day Purdue's looking right at a big 10 championship effect by the time some of the folks listen to this who knows purdue may may be that at least have a share of the title but talk about just that that enthusiasm that you've found in in boilermaker nation and and certainly buoyed by uh, the play of Matt Painter's team this year. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an exciting time, especially for for a newcomer like me to be joining uh, Boiler Nation. And as we're uh, 
you know, going into March, I think um, there's probably not, not been this level of anticipation, right. For no. a team. And I, and I know the history, right. Of, of boiler fans. And so we don't want to, we don't want to uh, count our chickens before they hatch, but I think, um, you know, with, with likely the Midwest rounds one and two, hopefully Purdue's in Indy. And then you're looking at even sweet 16 elite eight up, up in Detroit and then Phoenix, uh, you know, we're excited because a big March and hopefully April certainly I think would translate into some, some great visibility for our work at the Alliance. Yeah, no doubt. And it is a, it is a, as much as anything, you've got to do education. Yes, you're raising money, but this whole new world is, is a whole new world. And you've been around athletics for, for a long time, but it's changed so dramatically. And and we kind of, it's always good for us to go back and kind of re rephrase and re kind of do collective 101 so that's kind of what i wanted to ask you about just talk about the collective why maybe seem obvious to some people not obvious to others why does it exist what's the net what's the need for the collective if you go back to basics yeah so so the collective really exists to support the advancement of nil opportunities for Purdue student athletes and and like it or not it's it's part of the equation right in today's yeah. landscape of of college athletics. And, uh, you know, so I live outside Purdue. I'm not a Purdue athletics employee. However, with Boilermaker Alliance being the exclusive collective of, of Purdue athletics, um, in a lot of ways, I feel like I'm an extension of the team. You know, we collaborate very closely with John Purdue club and, and the rest of the sports administrators inside athletics. And that, that level of trust and alignment is key in order for us to, to really move the ball uh, down the field, whether it's a uh, fundraising or just raising the, the the brand and the visibility of Boilermaker Alliance. Key thing to do. Nobody is more important. Uh, in, in Ryan Waller's in an interview that we posted, we'll be posting on our site to uh, a uh, 25 minute interview he did with Tom Deanhart uh, uh, on the Boilermaker Alliance, just talking about that need. I mean, that need for being able to raise money. And Coach Ryan Waller's talks about what a better position Purdue is in this year versus last and that improved that's taken a lot of work by a lot of people to get that done yeah yeah a number of people have stepped up you know to, to, to give you a sense of just the the growth year over year uh the, the collective uh 4x it's its budget year over year and so number of very generous folks um from a donor perspective as well as our our membership model which we continue to to really drive home. And you guys have been a great partner at Golden Black on that. And, uh, you know, our, our work is both on the charitable side, as well as on the for-profit side, you know, we've got a couple different lanes into how we, we, we raise funds and, uh, the charitable piece, obviously as a 501 C3, uh, we can accept, we can accept donor dollars and our student athletes go out into the community, uh, every month to serve and lift up the boys and girls club, uh, varsity blood bank, reading at elementary schools. And that's a, that's a really neat opportunity for them to have uh, as student athletes as part of their experience at Purdue. Uh, and then on the, on the for-profit side, you know, as we look at uh, NIL deals for student athletes, you know, the membership model, which starts as low as $25 yeah. a month. And Alan, I want to share that we've got an anonymous donor who has pledged to match up to $2 million in new members. So, you know, we, we really, uh, want to grow this um, from where we're at today to I'd love to see us at 3,000, 4,000 members, which with a living alumni base of 600,000, I think is certainly feasible. And that allows us to be more of a sustainable recurring revenue stream versus going for, you know, big checks every year. And so it's been uh, a lot of people have contributed to the success and and we're working every day to come up with creative ways to drive revenue. Yeah, we'll put links on how to join the Boilermaker Alliance as well. Uh, not only with this with this uh, Golden Black Live, but also our Saturday simulcast because it is important that uh, uh, people understand what the deal and the importance of this moving forward. I mean, it is a daunting task for every Power Five school, every school really in in, in college athletics that to, to be able to figure this stuff out and be able to move it forward. You mentioned the membership model. You've got all different levels. One of the things, as David has said, is, is that you get Golden Black as part of that. You also get some exclusive videos. I mean, like we talked about the Ryan Welders interview. 
interviews with all of the transfer portal guys in football. Matt Painter comes on and talks. Uh, uh, Brian Newbert has interviewed him uh, in addition to other coaches and uh, players. I mean, it's a, it's a full-blown process to make that membership model uh, relevant and uh, of value to Purdue fans. Yeah, it really is. I mean, that, that content you've alluded to, the, the Coach Walters interview that came out recently, I mean, it's 25 minutes that I think any any Purdue football fan would would love to to see. And then we, as you mentioned, we've done interviews with all the, the transfer portal players that we picked up here in the last couple months. And we're going to continue to invest there so that we've got exclusive content that goes above and beyond that the great content that you guys already provide to to Golden Black members. Yeah, to, to be clear too, if you're if you are a Golden Black subscriber, you can become a member of the Alliance. It's a pretty seamless process. You know, we'll basically convert you over uh, to 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 that as well. You'll still get the same. You still get the access to all our premium content, our message boards, and the Boilermaker Alliance message board. That's a big you know a, a big added benefit if you're interested in supporting the Alliance. And again, we'll have more information with that on the site as well. In addition to what we link to the Ryan Walters interview too, because uh, that's a big thing that uh, big thing moving forward is again that uh, access to to uh, guys. I know Mason Gillis, for example. I know he was in the schools on Thursday uh, in Lafayette. Uh, uh, Talk about your, you know, you've got it. And Ryan Walters talks about in the interview that that you have a lot of contact, uh, and you and your staff uh, to be able to not only work with coaches but work with work the athletes to be able to get them uh, out in the community and actively doing it. Talk about how that's worked in in your time uh, so far because uh, you've got to have a lot of participation for and deal with coaches that are extremely busy uh, with what they have to do. Yeah. Uh, it's been my experience that the coaches and the student athletes really uh, want to make this work. They, they recognize the value that the collectives bring. And so they've been they've been great partners in terms of whether it's the student athletes getting out and, and serving. Right. Which is part of their their contract with the alliance. And I've got a staff member, uh, Maddie, who does a great job coordinating with the with the charities and the student athletes. And there's a lot of busy schedules. And so she navigates that. With, with ease. And then we've got, you know, the, the coaches and their staffs are great partners and trying to help us, you know, capture videos of the impact of how NIL has impacted student athletes and their families and how it's enabled them to use some of that money so that their parents or family members can fly out and watch them play in games and get a, get a hotel room and pay for parking. I mean, things that, that add up, uh, that's certainly well above and beyond, you know, the scholarships that, that they receive. And, so it's it's been uh, there's a lot of stakeholders, a lot of bases to cover, uh, but that that level of cooperation collaboration is key. Yeah, I know one of the ones you talked about earlier, and it was I think is also a video too with Lance Jones, and of course Lance, uh, who's made such a huge difference uh, uh, to Matt Painter's squad, and and uh, it's hope to do go deep into March. But that story is an interesting one, a very personal one, because, of course, the, Lance's father passed away. But talk about that and what that has meant. Uh, just to, uh, Maybe it's anecdotal, but it is a, a shining example of what some of this stuff can provide, some of this, these funds can provide for, for a guy like Lance Jones in a time of need. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Big Ten Conference did a great job with that, that package, that story that came out. I think last month, but right. yeah, you nailed it. Uh, when Lance transferred in, uh, you know, my understanding is, is, you know, his father uh, passed away around the same time and, you know, the entire Purdue team came, came to the funeral, which, you know, he was new to the team. I know that really lifted his spirits, but I think he's been able to use some of, you know, his NIL money uh, when the team was out playing and playing at the Maui Invitational back in November and his mother was able to come out and watch him play. And so it's been a, a real meaningful difference, you know, in, in that specific incident. Yeah. And, and certainly, uh, uh, Lance has uh, gone through a lot and, and, uh, and being able to do that is a huge advantage or huge plus for. He, he's for a viral Denver. sensation this year. The, uh, yes. Yeah, he is. Has, uh, has taken off, you know, so I see yeah. t-shirts and all sorts of things out there. Well, that's the thing. It's kind of interesting. It is really interesting, really. And you talk about in one of your one of your partnerships. I want to talk about other ways. You know, one, one is with Home Field Sports, somebody that we've worked with over the years. Very creative in terms of how they how they produce uh, merchandise, but also seeing all the things that uh, it really has 
as we talked about, spawned a whole nother world. You know, the the big maple shirts to for, for Zach Eady on down the line. But it has caused uh, uh, or has given the opportunity for some of these uh, student athletes to really to test their marketing uh, acumen yeah. as they move forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you referenced the home field uh, deal. That's yeah. something that we just executed uh, earlier this month. So home field apparel. Uh, great, great retail uh, company based actually in Indianapolis. And they've got, I think, close to 180 uh, licenses with D1 schools, uh, Purdue being one. So that's been in place. And and we were approached about um, being a part of their initial uh, wave of a, of a program that really would drive revenue into collectives. And so um, earlier, about a couple of weeks ago, there's going to be five more opportunities this year. Uh, so six days over the course of the year. If, if folks from Boiler Nation go on homefieldapparel.com and we'll be sure to put out put out uh, you know an email and make folks aware on social media when those days are uh, and use a specific code, BoilerUp24, uh, 20% of the proceeds of, of whatever their sale is goes into the collective on those six days. And then the, any day throughout the year, if they're a new first time home field customer, 10% uh, of proceeds, again, the code BoilerUp24 needs to be used goes into the collective. So again, creative way to drive revenue. You also referenced the NIL store, uh, which is actually done through a different uh, partner with the university, Campus Inc. Uh, the NIL store I know has had a lot of success. That's that's actually currently outside the collective, but that's a great way for student athletes to directly monetize their name, image, and likeness. And, and they get a cut of every t-shirt sold directly to the student athlete. So uh, again, you're going to probably continue to see more of these sort of marketing partnerships. There's a lot of other categories where I think we can get creative. Yeah, I think one of the things that you have to have in, in your role, it seems, is that uh, you got to be nimble. <laughs> you got to be willing to deal with change and deal with a changing landscape. I mean, there's been so much talk about not only legislation, but how and where this is going. I, I guess that, that would be a question I'd have. How do you see, now that you're in the arena on a living, breathing, it uh uh, on a daily basis, and then some. How do you see this? Did you see this settling? Do you see this constant state of flux? Uh, how do you how do you look at this uh, down the road? Yeah, this is uh, is a popular question, and and you know I I talk about this with my board as well as with Purdue Athletics. You know, in terms of our of our stance, Alan, it's it's business as usual, right? There's a lot of yeah. swirl out there and injunctions and different things happening. It feels like <laughs> almost every other week. But, you know, we're, we've got a job to do in the near term, and that's to, to raise the profile, to, to relentlessly pursue uh, revenue, creative ways to drive revenue, both, both through uh, charitable dollars as well as our membership revenue and, and potential corporate deals. And so that's really our focus. Uh, we're not going to get too swept up in, in, you know, what is a year from now or three years from now look like? Will it look different? More than likely, yes. Uh, yeah. But in the near term, we, we really want to keep our our focus on what can we directly can control because there's a lot out there that we can't control. Yeah, it's control what you can control. That's a, I think it's got to be a an absolute must if I'm if I'm sitting in your shoes. All right, I want to ask you about Ryan Walters because uh, again in that interview we talked a little, we touched on him a little bit, but just you, you've gotten to know some of these folks. You see what uh, what makes him uh, able and capable of the job he's doing. Yet it is a challenging job. Not only just putting a football team on it in, in an eighteen, what will now be an eighteen-team Big Ten conference, but also, you know, it's the head on a swivel. Well, you've got to be ready. You've got to be nimble. You've got to be ready to to you know the month of January is crazy when it comes to the transfer portal, and you guys get tied into that. But just give us a sense of how close you're working, not only with Ryan but his staff, just because. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to do it. One would think to be able to move things forward in terms of acquiring the talent you want at Purdue. Absolutely. You know, I've been I've been blown away by by Coach Walters for a relatively young uh, head coach in a in a Power Four school. Obviously, entering his second season. I mean, that the role of a head coach has evolved so much over the last three years. You know, fundraising really wasn't in in the in the uh, probably job description not too long ago. And he's been a great partner in terms of saying, hey, Dave, who, who can I call? Who do you want me yeah. to follow up with, right? And he'll make those calls. He's not just coming saying, hey, where's the money? He, he's willing to be a partner in having those conversations and casting and laying out his vision for uh, supporters of Purdue football to really hear kind of, 
hey, how we're approaching it at Purdue, uh, even within the Big Ten, right, is probably different than some of the other schools. And so he's been a, a really fantastic partner. We, I try to be, um, you know, very collaborative, supportive. I know this is a big priority of his uh, in the spring. Uh, we've got a, you know, a spring portal coming up uh, mid-April after the spring football game going into the first of May. And so uh, this is a this is a top priority as he laid out in his interview uh, last week with you guys. Yeah, no doubt it's going to be there. All right, I'm going to give you the floor to give us the last elevator speech, or you've kind of given the elevator speech. But what, yeah. what else? Do, what else is really top of mind as you as you continue to navigate your way through all of this uh, and uh, your day to day? Well, we're we're always prioritizing men's men's basketball, women's basketball, football, and women's volleyball. So I know we haven't touched on all those in this interview, but that that's really our priority. Again, we have the ability to take in funds for any any varsity sport, and we have for for sports beyond those. Uh, but it's it's all gas, no breaks. And so as we <laughs> March, obviously, we're we're hoping for big things for men's basketball. We've got. Uh, spring spring football game is around the corner right after that April 13th spring practices coming up um so it's 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 not slowing down and and again my encouragement would be um you know get on boilermakeralliance.com become a member uh you'll get access to this exclusive content again we've got a a very generous uh, anonymous anonymous match for up to two million dollars towards new memberships we've got to get this flywheel going and that's you care about Purdue athletics, that's the best way to engage with the collective right now. All right. Well said, and we appreciate that very much. We'll also have that information, but as I said, on our site. So if you have need more information, this is a group that uh, will, will answer your call, so to speak, if you have uh, more questions and things of that nature. All right, David, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we'll do this again. I, this will be an every, every, every at least twice a year conversation because uh, when we can find time, you're the fastest uh, uh, maybe the business ma busiest man in show business these days. I, I don't uh, envy your role, but you, you seem to be doing it very well. We appreciate that very much. Thank you for taking the time to join us uh, here at uh, on goldenblack.com. All right, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be back with Kevin Sullivan. We'll join. Kind of get Welcome to segment three. Kevin Sullivan joins us. Uh, Kevin Sullivan Communications.com. Is that correct? Uh, correct. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah. No, you can, more... you can get it. Yeah. Uh, KSullivanComs.com, KSullivanCommunications.com. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll both work. He will not sell you a used car. I promise no. that. But but he is one of the great uh, – A, he's a Purdue graduate. B, he's worked close with Purdue Athletics over much of his career. But he's also – it's good to be an expert at your young age. So we're going to call, we're going to, we're going to market you as an expert, a communications expert. And one of my favorite people we have, we have much longer private conversations than we do public though. We don't do them near enough, but Kevin, welcome to the show. I know it's a highlight of your media career. Uh, it, we're glad to have you on. I, I, it is. I love it. Thanks so much for having me on Alan. Yeah, Kevin's credentials are, are interesting. He has been on the White House staff working uh, for George W. Bush on the back end of uh, of his his second term, if I'm right. He has worked with the Dallas Mavericks uh, after his days in sports communications with Purdue, and of course NBC as well does and still does consulting. But I, I know that uh, the Boilermakers are are near and dear to your heart, and. Uh, I guess my message to all Purdue fans is you best enjoy this. But even from uh, from where you sit, this has been a lot of fun to watch so far this year. And I did see you at uh, the, for the Arizona game, so you did see that one in person. That's right. You know, and now that we're the calendar has flipped and it's now <laughs> March, yeah. and my friends are here in Dallas. What? Uh, in fact, it happened this morning. It's okay. It's March. You know how you feeling? You know the boilers. You know March has not been kind, and. Uh, I, I'm nervous. I mean, my heart rate is a little elevated. I, I fear, I, I have to admit, as a Purdue fan, uh, I know your uh, uh, viewers, listeners, and readers can relate to, we just naturally assume there is heartache, doom, gloom, tragedy, catastrophe, calamity, chaos, and mayhem around every corner. Uh, we've been trained to feel that way, even though I'm an optimistic person, and I think this is going to be the year. And Believe in Coach Painter, of course, and uh, let's go. Yeah, that Zach Eady guy is pretty good too, though, isn't he? He is pretty good, and as a matter of <laughs> fact, 
uh, an anticipation. That's a, li- a lead right. I lead right into you. Go ahead. TV my right up, and yeah, uh, you know we've 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 kind of done this annually, and and uh, the last uh, couple times, you know, I make a point of speaking to uh, NBA personnel people who are friends of mine, uh, people with lots of experience uh, making these kind of decisions, and you know, Jonathan Gavoni, who's a well-regarded yeah prognosticator at ESPN.com. Came kind of out of nowhere recently and said Edie is now a lottery player. And I had one person who would know tell me this week that is not gonna happen. Yeah. And so here, here's kind of when I put together what I heard from these two different uh, experts uh, on the inside, uh, they told me that the game, the NBA game is too fast for him. They admire him as an athlete, they admire him as a great teammate. They know he's improved, they know he's worked on his game, they know he's that he is uh uh, he is agile. He, you know, the fact that he, you know, he played baseball and hockey and other sports, uh, they're all they're 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 they're, they're there's a lot of Zach Eady fans. They feel that the, the best thing for Zach would be for him to be drafted later, not earlier. And that the expectations that would come from being a lottery pick would not serve a player like Zach, who even as two time national player of the year, uh, is going to need some time. Now, remember, if I'm not mistaken, Oscar Shibwe was the player of the year, the year before Zach, he's in the G league. You think of a player, uh, like, uh, Timmy from Gonzaga, uh, uh, who is in the G league, you know, these big guys, the game is so fast and it's this high pick and roll and they'd make switches and that, uh, that who would he guard? And, you know, and, uh, so one, one person told me the Boston Celtics, uh, would be the, a great place for him to land. They've got a history with big people. They're a, they're they're the best team in the East, so there's going to be patience. Uh, it's a good organization, and and uh, so hopefully Zach goes, you know, maybe later in the first round, uh, and get, but gets in a situation where he would he would have some time to become an NBA player. The good news is it sounds like he is going to be drafted. Now, others that I spoke to. Uh, said, you know, for players like Zach, sometimes it's better not to be drafted. Then you can find your spot where you have the best chance uh, of being brought along the right way, or a coach who's willing to say, you know what, I can, I can, uh, I can use him. And then the last point, uh, and then I'll wrap this up. I know I've given you a lot here. Is is Boban Marjanovic is a little bit of a of a template potentially for Zach. He's still in the NBA on the Rockets yeah. now. He's had a great long career unbelievable teammate he's beloved you know he, he has gotten national ads including state farm and i think home depot was the other one right because of how much he is beloved i got to know him a little bit when he was on the mavericks for a couple of years but but marjanovic is a player that coaches starting way back when he was on san antonio and detroit rick carlisle did this with him in dallas of course now the pacers coach where he may not play for three or four games but then there's a matchup where they feel like they can use him, and and he 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 would play some in, in that game, always kind of staying ready. So that's a big download on kind of what a couple of NBA personnel uh, veterans uh, think is in the offing. Yeah, I think it's it's great analysis, and you and you've lived it. The fact, that, and I've watched a couple of things or seen a couple of the mock drafts where he is on the back end of the first round. That seems to make sense. Certainly, bought the Celtics is an interesting one because. Brad Stevens and Matt Painter are attached at the hip. Uh, uh, you know, I think your your point about him being a great teammate, extremely hard worker, but it is a fast league. He's got to find uh, he's got to find that niche. He would think. Uh, but man, I'll tell you, I watch. I was at practice a couple weeks ago and watch, and and I know he's finally made his three, which we saw right. against Indiana. But I also watch, and they do a shooting drill at the end of practice. And he hit, uh, I think, 10 or 11 in a row uh, from three, uh, and they look natural. I know that's not going to be his niche necessarily in that league, but it's going to be really – it will be a fascinating study uh, on where he ends up and and how and, and what role he has in the league. There's one thing's for certain, he's going, and uh, that is no surprise, and he should. Uh, but he it is a uh, thing, thing, and I think he he's going to make some money in that league at some point in time, and uh, or at a great point in time, and and well deserved. He is a and, great teammate, and, and, and if you ever, if you wonder, if you want proof that he's a good teammate, look at the reaction from yeah. that make that three pointer <laughs> that he made. Fletcher lawyers out of his mind. The bench erupts. Uh, it was a really cool moment. Uh, I admire, and don't forget, it was a two years ago. I think there was that video of Zach running a five thirty or whatever it was mile. Yeah. 
at 300 pounds or thereabouts. He was maybe even a little heavier at that point, uh, which is extraordinary. And so the guy has worked so hard and, and, and definitely, uh, uh, it seems to me there'd be a way to, to, for him to contribute. I never thought in my, my 18 seasons with the Mavericks that there would be a day where we would say we don't need a, uh, you know, a big man who's a two time national player of the year, but, uh, you know, and, you know, Yao Ming kind of got on the tail end. He yeah. may be the last one. He was also mobile and had a game, yeah. uh, you know, not, not, uh, unlike it's a little different, but not completely different from, from Edie. Yeah. Well, one thing's for sure. He is athletic. He is in shape. Uh, and he has been an unbelievable, you know, his college career is going to go down with all the all time greats. I mean, you can't minimize the fact that when you and I were in school or even you're a little bit, old, a little bit older than I am, but, uh, the Ralph Sampson's of the world. And, uh, and we watched Pete Maravich, the two time winners. There aren't all that the David Thompson's, there aren't all that many of them out there, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that uh, that's going to be what's ahead right. for Zach Eady and company, barring anything completely unforeseen on that. All right, you are an NBC guy, and Peacock has been right. the uh, the bane of every Purdue fan, well, every fan's existence because right. change is hard in this world, Kevin, as you right. know, uh, yet that is the world. But give us a little bit of flavor, not only with that, but also where you see – we're going to be streaming everything from now to the end of time. What one think is that a fair assessment or how do you yeah, look at that? The disruption, you know, a few years ago came to television and then it came to live sports. And yeah. what I could, what I would tell people is uh, don't fight it. This is how it is. Anybody who tells you that they know how this is going to end up <laughs> doesn't know. You know, they're, they're kind of guessing, <laughs> yeah. but, but here's the deal is, is uh, everything is going to be streamed. And I did have the uh, occasion, you know, I, I got to do my prep if you're going to bring me on goldenblack.com. I know. It. It's a hard deal. work, man. <laughs> and and I, I spoke to Sam Flood, who's the executive producer yeah. of NBC Sports, and he's told me a couple interesting things. First of all, with the with the, with the, with the, uh, the home football games that they did, uh, one of them might have been NBC, one of them Peacock, Syracuse, I forget which was. Yeah. But they loved coming to Purdue. And had a really good experience uh, being there. The atmosphere and, and and the whole the whole deal. So just as a little side note, they I think we've 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 cultivated. It was the Purdue. Syracuse game, yeah, yep. Yeah, and then we've cultivated some some Purdue fans up in uh, Stamford, which is now the home of NBC Sports. But anyway, on, on Peacock, it's here. It's not. It, it not only is it not going away. It's going to be more and more and more and more. And it, the it's growing. It's only five ninety nine a month, so it's not a big ask. Yeah. The user experience, you know, they've done two Olympics on Peacock. Uh, Paris is going to be live, live, live on Peacock. And, and the user experience has improved with each big thing. But we're in a world now, Alan, where, you know, the early rounds of golf majors are on, on streaming. For crying out loud, we've got NFL games only yeah. <laughs> available on streaming. And so this is the world. Uh, NBC has taken it uh, seriously. I think has done a good job. User experience has gotten better, and the numbers are growing. And Sam even said to me, he said, "You know, things like having Purdue games, the number one ranked, and a few of those occasions, Purdue Boilermakers in men's basketball, and Caitlin Clark, uh, of course, <laughs> uh, with uh, at Iowa has has fueled, you know, their their uh, the growth of Peacock. It, it's been a big, you know, uh, lot, big increase in subscribers." And so I would say, get used to it. You know, figure out as a consumer how many of these things can you afford? Do you want to have? Are you really going to use? Now we saw the bundle get announced a few weeks ago. Uh, to everyone's surprise, even the leagues didn't see it coming. Where Warner Brothers Discovery and and, uh, and ABC Disney uh, came together with a Hulu like bundle. It's basically everybody but NBC and CBS, Peacock, Paramount Plus, uh, and and. Uh, you know, ESPN is already formulating a direct to consumer uh, streaming option that they feel will be ready in 26 or 27, I believe. Uh, and so it's 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 just coming, and it's how it's going to be in this this bundle that's being formed. If it all goes through, of course, includes Fox. I should have mentioned, which yeah. includes which has a Big Ten, you know, half the Big Ten deal and the Big Ten Network. So as Purdue fans, we're going to be watching on streaming. And so just figure out what works best for you. But I would say uh, it's not, there's not much point to resisting uh, uh, any, any further. The old days are, are gone and it's a different day 
Uh, and in some ways, uh, you know, there's advantages to it, but it's just different. And you're right. Change, change is hard. Change is hard, especially in the pocketbook, but it doesn't may not be at the end of the day more. If you figure out how to manage your, you know, if, if somebody right. gave me a chance to, to have the big 10 network peacock and, and HBO max and maybe Netflix, I might be good. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. and, and of course, I'll get my WLFI fix, but I can put my my own thing up with that as well. So it, yeah. it is an interesting, interesting study going down. I, I have to ask you though, in the wonderful world of media rights and the fact that we're having all of this chaos and in, in mostly in football, but uh, with with the conference realignment and all that. Do you see that appetite when now it's now we're looking at 2029 when all these contracts come? I mean, right. they just got signed, right? So tell me what you see for the future of this, because I do see some challenges of competitive balance, you know, making sure that the Rutgers or maybe even the Purdue's in football can be competitive at the bottom half of that Big Ten uh, so that a Purdue-Oregon game is is competitive and interesting to watch. How do you, How do you see that coming down the pike? Well, number one, you know, I think this Big Ten SEC task oh, wow. working group, whatever they're calling it, if if that clearly to me is a signal about where this is going, the there, I think there will be more haves and have nots, and I could see a day potentially, Alan, where you know it is uh, the, the Big Twelve, you know, and you see they're talking about going to fourteen teams in the college football playoff. Big Ten and SEC automatically get three, so now you've got this dogfight. You know, assuming Ohio State and Michigan remain dominant with, you know, with USC and UCLA and Penn State and and Washington and and on and on and on, uh, fighting for that third you know playoff spot. Hopefully, Purdue can be in that that yeah. mix. And so now you're the Big Twelve, uh, and of course the SEC now with Texas and Oklahoma That's added crazy. so Georgia and Alabama and and Florida and who's you know maybe on the way back. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'll see. So. Uh, yeah, I think the haves and have nots are probably coming. So where does that leave the mid majors? Maybe doing their own separate thing, you know, one day, you know, uh, who knows, but the revenue involved in this is staggering. And, and that's obviously, you know, money has always been a part of college sports and pro sports. It just has not quite been in our face as yeah. much as it is now with NIL, the portal, the stuff you see on the PGA tour with them getting $3 billion of outside money so they can increase purses and, and benefits to the players. It's just much more in our face, which, which, uh, which we don't like. In fact, I heard a, a branding expert a couple months ago say one of the big advantages to WWE is nobody knows what those superstars get paid because we're yeah, kind of getting it's... sick of the, of the, of the, of the money being in our face and, uh, you know, there was a freshman uh, defensive lineman, I believe, in Florida who signed and then bought his mother a house as a <laughs> freshman in college. He had enough NIL money. You know, that's usually the thing you see a player do when they sign their first pro contract. This guy isn't even, I don't think, out of high school. I don't know. Maybe he was an early signee. But but anyway, it's a different time. It's totally driven by money. And I think the haves and have nots are coming. And, uh, and I think fortunately for Purdue fans, I think the big 10 is well positioned, uh, to be, you know, to have that major, uh, seat and influence, uh, at, at the table of whatever it's going to look like. Uh, and clearly the NCAA, which in my view, totally abdicated, uh, uh, responsibility over, over NIL, uh, is, a, is a bystander at this point, the conference commissioners are in charge and, uh, and let's see, you know, let's see how it plays out. I think it's a reminder, Kevin. It's not our world anymore, is it? <laughs> I mean, not I mean, our you world. And I are, it's it's it is different, and it is part of the deal. I, my only concern for Purdue, and it sounds like if that alliance, Purdue just needs to get invited to the dance in football. I mean, it yeah. just needs to not get left out. I don't think necessarily that's going to happen. Maybe that alliance and the fact that it's part of the Big Ten and continues to be, they all eighteen of them get invited. They all work well for Purdue uh, from that standpoint. As we look down the road in, into uh, into the twenty twenty and into the twenty thirties, really, where all this may may all come to pass. All right, yeah. I have to ask in our our mutual friend and colleague to some extent, Chris Klink, who uh, because they're a sponsor, I'll mention them Triple X, and we wish you were with us. We're gonna we're gonna yeah. have a little 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 lunch here in in a little bit uh, with our late afternoon snack with Chris, but. Back to your day, because it was the last time Purdue 
made the final four 1980 and uh right was a basketball manager and you were a senior in college is that I, right? I was a senior uh and, and uh Desperately hoping I would graduate, which I which I did. Okay. And uh, were you yeah, praying we, or hoping? I was praying and and <laughs> and uh, cramming and 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 I was trying to get Tim Clojo to help me with my my studies is what I was yeah. doing. Uh, but yeah, it was an incredible time. You know the the sports information office, which you know, you you eventually became a part of. Uh, we had an incredible group. Mark Brand, who went on to a Hall of Fame sports information career at Arizona State. Uh, I don't want to start naming names. John Hostetler, uh, oh, yeah. who goes to the NSA and is the funniest guy talking about Purdue being Indiana in, in any sport. Uh, you know, Laurie Kiley, who went on to great things in, in, on the corporate side. Karen Snap, the inimitable yeah. uh, snapper, and 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 Clank and me and and Don Coitz, the rail man. And we oh, had, yeah. he had a great career. And 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 so that bunch of us, you know, our our my senior year. Uh, now Snepper was already graduated, then yeah. year. but but anyway, we we you know we had the Peach Bowl followed by the Blue Bonnet Bowl followed by the the uh, Final Four, which was an incredible time to be a Purdue student and and, and having uh, a little bit of a backbench seat there as a student assistant. So we all got to to work the Final Four as helpers in the press room, uh, passing out stats, you know that that kind of thing. I remember sitting; my seat was behind the UCLA bench uh, at least for. Uh, or one of the, I don't know if it was Saturday or Monday, but uh, but we got to go, and it was just an incredible thing to be a part of, and I still think about it uh, to this day, and 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 you know it was a great Purdue team, and Lee Rose did a lot of, did a, accomplished a lot in a short amount of time at Purdue, including you know getting us back to the Final Four, you know for the first time, and uh, you know we didn't think at that point it was going to be forty three years uh, or forty four years till we got back, but. Uh, but you know, it had been eleven years, I guess, right since yeah. '69. So that's right. Uh, so anyway, it was it was a great experience and really fun to share with our, our group of uh, you know Tom Tom Shoup and Paul Jensen were our leaders, and Brooke Merrow was the yeah. was the grad assistant uh, following the great Karen Croak Heisler. May she rest in peace. Yeah. So yeah. And you guys never had a had a libation or anything while you were working or at the end. You never no. did this. No, it was in fact you were all teetotalers. <laughs> well, uh, let me tell you, the real story here was <laughs> the real story here is that uh Clink and I, I think Cloge was with baseball, so he couldn't yeah. leave this early. But Clink and I left campus and we drove to to Lexington where the where um the elite the eight was. Yeah, if I remember this correctly. Right. And we beat Duke, led by Mike right. Jaminski and some other yeah. players, uh, to get to the Final Four. Well, Clink and I drove from Purdue to Lexington. We stopped at the University of Cincinnati because we wanted <laughs> to go meet the SID there. We, you know, we were hungry, you know, kids trying to find our way. And we did have a libation or two. There was a famous bar called, I think it was called the Two Keys in Lexington. And I actually was in Lexington because I, I I do a little work with the University of Kentucky. And I asked them if it's still there and they drove by and it. It's not in the location it was when Clink and I terrorized it in 1980. I think we went there before and after. I think I think uh, Ken Olinger, who we called Muhlenberg, I think yeah. Jensen, that name, he became the designated driver because we were responsible young citizens. Um, but that was the trip that I remember being more out of control than the Final Four trip. Although I'm pretty sure the Final Four trip was out of control too. And and thankfully I don't do that anymore. But it was just incredible fun and and great camaraderie with with the crew and just a real privilege as a young kid trying to figure out. I already knew what I wanted to do based on the first day that I got in the sports information office. My when I walked into room. 16, 15, 15, what was 15, 15, 15 in Mackey Arena, yep. my, my, my life changed. So yeah. uh, deep, deep gratitude for, for, for Purdue and, and, and Purdue. Uh, now, of course, it's called athletic communications or stuff. Something strategic and, communication. Strategic communication. Which it all is, right? <laughs> Which it all is, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but I love it and great memories. Yeah. I think the story was, and we could, we're going to have to cut this off because we could go on for we could have our own podcast. I'm afraid, but uh, no, the whole thing was it was the old uh, Charlie Daniels, L.A. via Omaha. You could return home from Lexington via Evansville or something like that. You could with Olinger. I, I don't remember what the whole story was, but yeah, uh, it, we it, definitely it was... we 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 did. <laughs> we ended up. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, you know, we ended up. We when we had. 
picked up a guy named Gator Wilson who was a <laughs> student, and he was part of that. Although I don't, I think that was the that was the Rupp Arena game, not the Market okay. Square Arena. Yeah, I think Clank will have a better <laughs> memory, so ask him at the Triple X. Uh, and have a root beer for me, and I, you know, and I, hope, I can't wait to uh, to get back to campus and get over there. I have a you triple T shirt I wear all the time. So yeah, I, you I'm know ready. what? You know what's interesting is if Purdue does make it to Glendale, there will be students just like you driving right from West Lafayette to Glendale, as opposed to West Lafayette to Indianapolis. Of course, Glendale near Phoenix, but uh, that's right. what ma- that's what makes the experience. And I will say this as a manager, and you is there is nothing. Nothing like in my sporting life, I can remember the drive from Lexington to West Lafayette, knowing you're going to the Final Four. Yeah. Unbelievable experience, yeah. and and uh, if you're a Purdue fan, uh, you hope that uh, this is you're going to yeah. have that experience. Maybe I, I driving hope. from driving out of Detroit, maybe back to West Lafayette before you head to Phoenix. Yeah, it was uh, it was great, and and before before we wrap up, I, I yeah. really I want to give a shout out as a subscriber okay. to GoldenBlack.com. Uh, and and I you know what Tom Deanhart does and and Brian and your whole your whole crew, it's really appreciated by us Purdue fans. But I also as a as a somebody who does this also for a living, this comm stuff, I, a little tip of the cap to Coach uh, Ryan Walters and, yeah. and and that operation. It's I don't know I have no inside information, uh, but it it appears to me as a reader uh, and and watcher of the video content that he has given Tom. And the and the, the you know the 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 goldenblack.com crew more access and information than had as great as the Brown years were. Uh, and I'm glad he was our coach and he he left it better than he found it and all that. Uh, it was you know there was it was it, information was uh, cliches were were more uh, abundant than than kind of insights and information I always found. And so so uh, so keep up the good work and 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 uh, really appreciate what those guys do because not only do they get good information and they're good writers but you can tell that they uh, they, they care you know they want to provide good information and and everything so so way to go carpic it's you guys do a great job. <laughs> Uh, that's the blind squirrel that I, I get. I, you, you're, it's who you associate yourself with, and I'm very thankful that uh, I had a long career with Brian and certainly with Tom, and Mike Carmen has helped us as well. You, you, you had to clear some cap space to get Mike. Uh, yeah, you know, we did. We're hemorrhaging cash at Golden Black with Carmen. <laughs> I tell him that all the time. But uh, That was a great pickup. A, yeah, yeah he's, was... he's great as well, but we're very, yeah. very fortunate, and we're glad that you – coming from you, that means a lot. So we, well, we had a lot of fun it. doing it. And and you're right, Ryan Walters is, has been that way. Matt Painter's as good as it gets when it comes to that stuff. Well, well that was another reason why the contrast with football. I should have said that. You know, is, yeah. is that is that Coach Painter is is phenomenal at this, and and um, and there was always a contrast. And I know football coaches are a different kind of deal sometimes, but but I appreciate the access to information and yeah. and uh, and everything. So all right, boil, well, we will boil look forward up. to. We'll look forward to seeing you in person. Maybe and would you would you make it the trek to Arizona if they had maybe to get there? yeah maybe yeah. I'm not gonna yeah. we shouldn't even be talking about no, it. No, I know it. We got you know what we got to Purdue has to make the trek down the street to Indianapolis and win two games there before. They by get the in. way, by the way, one more little nugget. I was doing uh, media training with the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, and, which of course it was a it was their their subsection of young players, which included Trace Jackson Davis. And super nice guy. I was almost yeah. disappointed at what a good uh, person <laughs> he was. And so, I, but I asked him before we got started. I, I said I shouldn't probably ask you this, uh, but why do you think Purdue has struggled in the tournament the last three years? And he, without hesitating, said it's the Big Ten tournament. And he said one year at Indiana, they p- ended up playing five games in seven days. Uh, you know, to you know, maybe that's including the first round yeah. of the tournament. Of course, I don't remember Indiana ever. Well, they had to play the play-in game though, too. That was part of it too. I think that was part of it. So, so, uh, so you know, and there's always been. uh, This is probably. I'm sure this is not true, but some people have felt that Tom Izzo, part of their success in the tournament, going back many, many years, was that he held back a little bit in the in the conference tournament. Uh, I don't know. So I'm not necessarily going to be disappointed if we don't have a long run. Uh, in, in the uh, in the conference tournament, I think our seed is hopefully going to be solidified at that point. But let's not let's not have anybody. Let's keep them all bubble wrapped uh, and and dur- during the conference tournament. Let's not uh, you know go to. Well, let's it. keep them healthy. I think that's what Purdue has to want to want to do, and 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 that is clear. But uh, I'm I'm going to buy that it's the Gene Katie. 
uh, rule. And by the way, the only time, just just a matter of fact, because we're a fact based, op- you're a big believer in facts. When Michigan State, the last team to win the NCAA tournament from the Big Ten, right? What did they What did they do in the Big Ten tournament? They won it. They won it. So in, in 2000. So and my point is, Gene yeah. Kelly said, "Who will be in the be in the crowd uh, Saturday night?" Uh, in fact, you're going to like the fact that it's going to be. You probably be able to see it on TV. It'll be striped gold and black with play hard and black uh, in 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 the student sections on Saturday night. It's going to be a great nice. environment. But Gene Katie used to always, they're, they're, you know what? They're eighteen to twenty two year olds. They don't know, you know, they're they're young. They should be ready. So we'll see. But whatever it takes, if you're a Purdue fan, uh, you just want to you want to you want to get through that first game and move on from there. I think that's one thing that's interesting about it is. Get through those first couple games, get some confidence, uh, and go go on top of the NCAA tournament and move on from there. And I'm gonna guess, I'm thinking it's gonna it's gonna happen at least through those games as well. This is a very good basketball team that we've all is. enjoyed watching. Hey, we all see. I'm gonna be late for my lunch now. That's it's good. My late lunch, I should say, with Chris. But no, we I appreciate the always great stuff, Kevin. We we could have you on every week, and uh, we appreciate that very much. We want to want to thank our sponsor, the Union Club Hotel. Uh, for uh, its support of Saturday simulcast. And, of course, our guest, Brian Newbert. Brian's really not a guest. He's uh, uh, my colleague, and I appreciate him very much. And then, of course, uh, David Neff of the Boilermaker Alliance and and, uh, Kevin Sullivan, too. We enjoyed having them on the show. We'll be back next week leading into Senior Day, which will be an emotional day in Mackey Arena. We're saying goodbye to Zach Eady and Mason Gillis and, of course, Ethan Morton. Our, our guest, uh, we'll be talking that and to have uh, some special guests for next week's show. So have a great week, everybody. And thanks for watching or listening. And a reminder, you can become a subscriber to goldenblack.com. Great uh, uh, gift idea for any Purdue fan. Uh, specials on as part of the On3 network too. But uh, And if you like us, make sure you, you uh, leave us a positive comment or subscribe to us also on our YouTube channel. Have a great weekend, all. Thanks so much.